welcome everyone who's just joining us. I'll just give it a few seconds for more, more people to join. Okay. I'll go ahead and get started as we have a very packed uh, hour and a half um, uh, for our webinar today. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the webinar on Decolonizing Humanitarian Action, a Multiplicity of Meanings, Modes and Methods, hosted by the Social Science and Humanitarian Action Platform, or SHAP for short. Um, as a first priority, I just want to make sure everyone is aware of how they can switch to listening to the French translation if they wish. Um, Gabrielle, would you mind just explaining in French? Oui, uh, cette discussion sera traduite simultanément en français et pour activer l'audio en français, uh, cliquez sur Interprétation en bas de votre écran Zoom et sélectionnez la langue que vous, vous, que vous souhaitez entendre. Uh, je crois que si vous êtes, uh, vous êtes au téléphone, um, il faudra appuyer sur les trois, les trois points en bas à droite de votre écran. Um, oui. Thanks, Gabrielle. And we'll hear again from Gabrielle shortly, um, but first a few words from me. Um, once again, thanks everyone for joining, especially those who've just come in in the last few seconds. Um, my name is Tabitha Harinik, and I am a research officer working with the Social Science and Humanitarian Action Platform at, as well as with the Institute of Development Studies, or IDS. Um, SHAP is a collaboration between nine partners whose logos you can see on the screen and is funded by Wellcome Trust and FCDO. Through five work streams, SHAP provides social science insights and tailored analysis that can be quickly integrated into health emergency and humanitarian crisis response. SHAP works closely with international, regional, national, and local partners to strengthen strategy, policy, networks, and capacity. And we support action that is informed by context, engages with communities, and focuses on the needs of the most vulnerable. For more information about SHAP, you can visit our website and follow our Twitter account, and you can see the URL and our Twitter handle on the bottom of each slide. Um, but what we're really here to talk about today is our SHAP fellows. Uh, so the SHAP, um, a key component of SHAP is our fellowship program, um, which brings together social science researchers and humanitarian practitioners based in the global south to come together for mutual learning and exchange and to foster communities of practice which in can contribute to contextually informed and effective responses to health and humanitarian emergencies through in-country and in-region leadership. Today, our webinar features four SHAP fellows who will reflect on the important topic of decolonizing humanitarian action from their own contexts. The fellows featured today include Michael Kunuji, uh, Michael is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Lagos, where he has taught for 15 years. He's led studies in the areas of adolescent and youth sexual and reproductive health and rights, intimate partner and domestic violence, humanitarian context, child health, and health systems and policies. In 2019 and 2020, he led Nigeria's first qualitative verbal and social autopsy of under five deaths in collaboration with relevant MDAs. His works are published in several peer-reviewed journals. We'll also hear from Paula Chavez. Paula is a Colombian researcher with more than 15 years experience working with vulnerable communities who manage their own territories. She holds a PhD in social sciences from the Wageningen University and, and recently she has focused on decolonial perspectives for gender studies and she works as a lecturer and researcher at the Radboud University in the Netherlands. We'll also hear today from Alexander Branco Pereira. Alexander is a PhD candidate in anthropology at the Federal University of Sao Carlos, where he is focusing on the political mobilizations of racialized migrants during the COVID-19 pandemic in Brazil and Canada, especially in healthcare contexts. He's been a visiting researcher at 
Canada's uh, at, in Migration and Integration at Toronto Metropolitan University. And in 2024, we'll be a visiting researcher at the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. He also coordinates Brazil's National Front for Migrant Health and the country's first health and migration observatory. Uh, finally, we'll be hearing from Obindra Chant. Obindra is a PhD candidate at the School of Health and Social Care at the University of Essex, uh, for which he received a GEM scholarship. His research interests and experience include work in global health, medical anthropology, disability studies, mental health, health systems, and philosophy of research, primarily through ethnographic, qualitative, participatory, and mixed methods. He's been a fellow at the Migration and Health in South Asia, at SHAP and at the International People's Health University and has authored several publications. At SHAP, we are also aiming to build global networks, including in the MENA region. Uh, and I would really like to flag at this point that we will be running our first SHAP fellowship in Arabic. We have also in the past run a fellowship in French. Um, the Arabic fellowship will begin in February 2024. And if you would like more information, including how to apply and applications have just opened, um, I will share a link with you in the chat um, so that you can uh, get more information. Um, I recognize that a webinar on this important topic may feel incomplete without an explicit perspective on the unfolding humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza, where civilians are suffering significant loss of life, tragic injuries, large-scale displacement, and destruction of critical infrastructure and services. The historical context against which the ongoing siege continues and the failures of the international community to, to demand a permanent ceasefire and to uphold international humanitarian law are themselves profoundly shaped by colonial forces and power dynamics. Today, I would point to the work of colleagues, including perspectives from IDS researchers about the historical trajectory that has led to this moment, as well as a recent webinar hosted by colleagues at the Fighting Against Institutional Racism Network on the health dimensions of the crisis, links to which I will also share in the chat shortly. Um, we recognize that serious humanitarian crises continue to affect people all around the world, most of which receive very little attention and resources, also a function of coloniality. Our panelists will highlight um, some of them today. So to help us do this, uh, we are joined also by Gabrielle Dao, who will chair um, the rest of today's webinar. Uh, Gabrielle is an assistant professor in the Department of Global and International Studies at the University of Northern British Columbia in Canada. Her research areas broadly include the political economy of conflict and peacebuilding, the impacts of and responses to environmental and climate change with a focus on water and their implications for vulnerabilities and insecurities, and the changing forms, spaces, politics, and experiences of humanitarian response. Across these areas, she's interested in colonial and post-colonial gendered and everyday relations and experiences. Her research focuses particularly on the Lake Chad and wider Sahel region and Sudan and South Sudan. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass the baton over to Gabrielle, who will take us through the, West, the rest of the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tabitha. Uh, again, welcome to all and thank you for joining us. I'm really pleased to be able to facilitate this discussion today. Encore une fois, bienvenue à vous tous. Je suis très heureuse de pouvoir faciliter cette discussion aujourd'hui. Um, before I begin talking about my own, um, uh, some initial reflections on the theme of today's discussion, um, I'm joining you from Canada, and it's good practice here in the settler colonial context to begin events by acknowledging and paying respect to the Indigenous peoples on whose territories were located, recognizing their pre-colonial presence, the forms of colonial violence and oppression against Indigenous communities that continue today, and long-standing forms of Indigenous resistance. And this is especially important, I think, given the focus of today's discussions. 
Um, I'm usually based at the University of Northern British Columbia, which is in the northwestern part of Canada. And so the place that I normally call home, the place I normally live and work, is situated on the traditional and unceded territories of the Klaitli Tene First Nation, which is part of the Dekel People's Territories. Although I'm joining you today from the completely opposite side of the country, um, I'm currently in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people of the Abiquet First Nation. Uh, je ne vais pas répéter tous mes points en français, mais je le ferai pour les noms des communautés et des territoires qui ne seront peut-être pas familiers aux interprètes. L'endroit où je vis et travaille normalement, dans le nord-ouest du Canada, est situé sur le territoire traditionnel et non cédé de la Première Nation Clayton, qui fait partie des territoires des peuples d'Akel. Mais je veux rejoindre aujourd'hui de l'est du Canada et je suis, suis situé à Mi'kmaq, le territoire ancestral et non cédé du peuple Mi'kmaq de la Première Nation Abiquet. Um, these territorial, not territorial acknowledgements are only a small, a very small first step in a much deeper process of decolonization in a settler colonial context. And for me, this means critically and carefully examining histories of colonization and resistance to them in the context of my own teaching, research, and learning. And this also involves reflecting on my own position in relation to ongoing colonial structures in an effort to better understand these and can contribute and to contribute to efforts toward decolonization, including by considering what it means to think about and work toward decolonizing humanitarianism from within a settler colonial state. In relation to humanitarian response, this is included reflecting often in collaboration with my colleague, Dr. Sinadivik um, at the University of Sussex, on the colonial histories and enduring colonial logics and relations of power, racist, gendered, and otherwise, that structure the dominant international humanitarian sector, including through the shifting policies, practices, and spaces of humanitarian response and their relationships with broader geopolitical dynamics. Um, it's involved reflecting on whose knowledge is and has been centered and whose has been marginalized and silenced in the humanitarian sector and in our discussions about humanitarianism. And it's involved considering the multiple forms of humanitarian assistance, care, solidarity, and resistance that are practiced in everyday ways by individuals and communities, including and especially by those who are directly affected by crisis and violence. And so in this context, I'm very much looking forward to hearing the reflections that will be shared by the four speakers and to your questions in response. Um, in terms of how the rest of this webinar will unfold, Michael, Paula, Alexandra, and Obindra, in that order, um, will each speak following their presentations. We'll have just under half an hour for questions and answers, although we'll have a five-minute break um, uh, after the presentations and before the Q&A. I'll remind the questions for the speakers before they start that they each have 12 minutes for their presentation um, and I'll be giving a signal when five minutes remain and a verbal reminder at two minutes. Um, and so with all of that said, uh, Michael, over to you. Thank you, Gabrielle. And thank you, uh, Tabitha, for organizing this webinar and for uh, this rare privilege to share my thoughts on this uh, topic. I'll be providing a general overview on the concept of decolonization of humanitarian action. The next slide, please. So I assume uh, that we are all familiar with the conquest, the annexation and the exploitation of different parts of the world by Western European powers between the 15th and 20th centuries as a historical reality. Colonialism itself rests on the belief in white supremacy and uh, it establishes um, and upholds um, that belief through structures in the different um, institutions, in the different spheres of society. 
and uh, it does not it does not spare any sphere of life from uh, political systems to family life and to the provision of aid in emergency uh, contexts. Next slide, please. So colonialism uh, left a world with the legacy of coloniality, which according to uh, Richardson, is the racial, political, economic, social, epistemological, linguistic and gendered hierarchical orders imposed by colonialism which outlive colonialism. And I think this definition is uh, apt, not just because it speaks to uh, the different dimensions of hierarchization, but also uh, to the retention of coloniality beyond the colonial era. Uh, the world including those benefiting from uh, the aftermath of colonialism, those suffering the effects of colonialism and the bystanders to a large extent have uh, all internalized coloniality. Next slide. So in humanitarian action, uh, what could we say are the markers of coloniality? One, racialized hierarchization of humanity and the belief in the inequality of peoples. Two, exploitative neoliberalism, which advantages the high income countries of the world. And three, power asymmetry that results uh, from lack of inclusion in humanitarian action agenda setting. Four, severism, and finally, tokenism. Next slide, please. So um, exploring the who, the where, the when, and how of humanitarian actions helps us understand how coloniality plays out uh, in different humanitarian uh, contexts. I mean, we could simply just ask who determines what the, uh, who determines that there is a humanitarian emergency in the first place? Or we could ask who is prioritized in humanitarian action? One recent case is the treatment of Africans in the Russia-Ukraine war. And uh, this Al Jazeera uh, news report captures the story well with that title. Africa Union disturbed by reports Africans stopped from escaping Ukraine. Next slide, please. Another case that I find quite sobering and at the same time interesting is the Ethiopian civil war. Many of us are aware of the Tigray region crisis in Ethiopia, but my guess is that we are aware of it because of our involvement with humanitarian uh, responses, whether as practitioners or as researchers or, or as persons affected directly by uh, the crisis. But outside our network, um, uh, one could uh, say that very little is known about this crisis that has claimed an unknown number of victims. Estimates put the death toll uh, at present between 600,000 persons and a million, with about 5 million persons displaced already. Uh, this quote that we see at the bottom of the slide tells the story of coloniality in humanitarian action. It says, the U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris accused Russia of committing crimes against humanity. But given the simultaneous near planetary silence on Tigray, it is safe to conclude that not all crimes against humanity are equal. Next slide. So to put this in perspective, the political crisis in Gaza and Ukraine uh, with about 18,000 and 70,000 deaths respectively appear to have received greater attention, both from the media and also from humanitarian actors. And I sincerely wish I could pass across the message and the severity of uh, the humanitarian emergency in Ethiopia without having to compare deaths. But I'm compelled to make this comparison for lack of a better way to drive home this point. Uh, the figures suggest that Ethiopia should be getting the most attention at present, but that is not the case, as we shall see in the next slide. 
So statistics support the view that Ukraine, for example, has received greater attention, at least in terms of the humanitarian aid received. And when we get to see the statistics next year, we can uh, guess what humanitarian emergencies have been prioritized in 2023. And this is simply evidence in support of hierarchization of humanity and by implication, coloniality. Next slide, please. So when aid is structured in a way that privileges donors by buying them opportunities and power in low and middle income countries, then we can say that humanitarian action has become exploitative and by implication, colonial. Uh, the next slide. Also, uh, saviorism. Um, that is actions that suggest that help comes only from certain parts of the world or humanitarian actions that fail to acknowledge the strengths of those countries and people believed to be vulnerable and needing aid are all, um, are all colonial. Uh, the next slide, please. So the concept of decolonization itself has featured prominently in three key uh, related contexts. And the first uh, in, is in the context of former colonies seeking full independence uh, as found in the works of writers like Fanon, Rodney, Nkrumah, and several others. It has also been used in the context of settler colonialism as Gabriel uh, uh, mentioned earlier, where colonialists have settled with indigenous peoples and have established um, a parallel system in virtually all aspects of life, uh, where the culture of the colonizers treated as superior and those of the indigenous peoples as inferior or even barbaric. And finally, and most recently, it has been used in the context of a cross-cutting movement that peaked in the roads must fall uh, movement in, uh, uh, in South Africa. And that movement sparked protest and calls uh, for decolonization in other parts of the world. For example, uh, we had the Oxford roads must fall protest then uh, the student-led conferences um, across continents, including in Harvard, Duke, Edinburgh, and several other places. Also, COVID-19 uh, somehow demystified the, the savior status of many high-income countries and showed the vulnerability of uh, the health systems. Ironically, it also pointed to unacknowledged resilience in health systems in many low and middle income countries. Next slide. So I'll say that there is no consensus on what exactly it means to decolonize uh, humanitarian action, but some ideas run through the calls for decolonization. And these include up upholding uh, the principles of respect for persons, equity, fairness, equality of races, uh, and of course, it's typically in a transformative, not a reformative way. Uh, upholding those core humanitarian principles of humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence is equally important, but I should also acknowledge that it may be difficult to arrive at any uh, universally acceptable definitions of concepts like justice, fairness, and equity. In some extreme situations, uh, advocates have considered outright discontinuation of humanitarian aid as a way of addressing coloniality in humanitarian action. Next slide. Just say so you have two minutes left, Michael. Okay. So finally, the calls for decolonization have their flaws, as other speakers will demonstrate. For example, they often appear that is, the cause themselves appear to leave those who matter most behind, and they don't give sufficient attention to how poor local investment in humanitarian action by uh, low and middle income country governments contributes to coloniality in humanitarian responses. I will stop here for now to allow other speakers uh, deepen this discourse with more context specific insights from around the world. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Michael. That was a, a wonderful introduction to the uh, um, starting point for uh, the subsequent presentations. And so now I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Paula. Thank you, Gabriel, and thank you, Michael, and thank you, Tabitha, for the invitation and for the possibility of being here, having this conversation with you. I'm going to present the Guardia Indígena, the Indigenous Guard, as an humanitarian response in the Northern Cauca region in Colombia. Uh, I am introducing this case uh, uh, as an humanitarian case because I know it very well. It was my PhD research done on this. Um, and as Tabita says, my name is Paula Chavez. I am from Colombia and I am uh, uh, working in, in the Netherlands in this moment. Uh, so next slide, so thank you, Tabita. So the humanitarian situation in Colombia is not as bad as it used to be a decade ago. However, there is still a lot of violence and armed groups affecting mainly the local population. These groups, uh, now people call them non-armed states, uh, not, not state armed groups, and they used to be called uh, criminal bands. And these are derived from the guerrilla groups and the paramilitary armies, armies in, and they are mainly uh, fighting for the control of the uh, cocaine traffic and the illegal mining exploitation in the country. Besides these groups, uh, the official army in Colombia has also been found guilty of human rights violations in many of these territories that you can see in the map. These are the violent actions during, uh, until, 2000, until March 2023 in the country. Uh, next slide, please. So in March of 2023, the International Committee of the Red Cross identified seven non-international -inter armed conflicts in Colombia. Three uh, conflicts between the government and the different guerrillas and ex-guerrilla groups, two conflicts between the guerrilla groups themselves, one conflict between uh, post-FARC irregular armed groups and paramilitary groups, one conflict among post-FARC irregular armed groups themselves. These groups uh, control the illegal operations in the regions and they attack mainly human rights defenders and environmental activists who are opposed to their actions. And these groups avoid events that attract international press because they really don't want uh, to, to be visible. The last international known case uh, was the kidnapping of Luis Diaz's father. He's a footballer player in Liverpool. And this case called a lot of attention from the international press so his father was released in 13 days by the ELN group guerrilla, and they state that they didn't know who he was. So they really, really don't want to have the, the attention of people. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to talk about a particular region in the country, is the Cauca region, where the indigenous guard are located. Uh, this region is located in the, south, in the south, southwest part of Colombia, and it goes from the Andean mountains until the Pacific coast. It has abundant resources that attract many armed actors. As I mentioned before, mainly um, this region is part of the Pacific corridor, and you can see in the picture um, in the left, uh, these are the routes that uh, take uh, uh, cocaine traffic, right? So this is one of the main routes to, for uh, taking the drugs out of the country and uh, smuggling uh, weapons. And the former guerrilla FARC used to have the control of the region until 2016. But after the peace uh, treaty was signed, the region has been in dispute among many smaller gangs that are many of them linked to the cartel of Sinaloa in Mexico. So this is one of the most violent region in Colombia. And next slide, please. So the Indigenous Guard um, is a non-violent self-protection strategy consolidated since 2001 in Colombia by the Indigenous tribe NASA in the Andean region. The Guardia Indígena is the result of a historical process of resignification of indigenous identity from the brave warriors that, uh, warriors that defeated the Spanish to um, a non-violent guard that we see nowadays. The guards are women, men, and children from the indigenous communities who voluntarily join, join the guard to protect their communities. They do this as a survival strategy. Uh, I was there between uh, 2014 until 2019, working with them and learning how they um, uh, perform their humanitarian actions. Uh, next, please. 
The main role of the Guardi Indigena is to provide collective protection from the indigenous communities using only symbolic we weapons. As the stick that you can see in the picture, this is the symbol of the power bestowed by the community. But this is also a symbol for protection. They develop cleansing and protection rituals often, but, but mainly before dangerous actions. And they use oral tradition to resignify historical events. All of this, from a Western perspective, uh, provides them with a strong, clear identity that combines the warrior with a peace builder, and that all these also provide them with emotional and psychological tools to be brave or even fearless in emergencies and dangerous situations. And I need to be very clear about this. This is a Western perspective, because even if I am Colombia, Colombian, I have been raised in a Western uh, education system, and for me to be in the communities, living with the communities, it doesn't mean that I can really understand uh, the meanings behind their actions. So there is a very interesting concept that is called the control equivocation that is very important. And when we study or work with communities, with indigenous communities, we need to recognize the limitation of our knowledge. How our knowledge, we could not, will never explain completely what is going on in the indigenous communities because we are outside their knowledge system. Um, ne next slide, please. So the Guardi Indigena is a type of uh, neighborhood watch that patrols the territory and reports suspicious, suspicious activity. So for instance, when the, one of these armed groups is coming to the community, people can react quickly. And if they have to run and hide just to avoid being killed, that's what they do. Uh, but they also consolidate some forms of indigenous self-justice systems. So they take care about the, their crimes in the communities. They preserve people's safety and autonomy in the territory. And they adapt to the humanitarian needs of the region. When I did my uh, PhD, for instance, they were, uh, their main task was to confront and keep armed groups outside indigenous territories and maintain the neutrality of the indigenous communities in the armed conflict between the government and the guerrilla. They, they also rescue minors that have been forcibly recruited by armed groups. They close illegal mining places in their territories. They rescue injured people in the context of warfare under the framework of human, humanitarian actions and among other tasks. Nowadays, um, next slide, please. They also uh, uh, do formal training for all the communities on how to defend their own territories. So the guard has been extended through the whole country there are uh, indigenous guards uh, from the Amazon to the uh, North Coast. Um, they uh, raise um, awareness about uh, peace building and they also are trained for anti-personal minds uh, and they continue doing their previous tasks. Next slide, please. So this is a decentralized organization. They follow the organization, uh, indigenous organization principles and ruling system. The hierarchies are very, very uh, versatile. The power is distributed. So for instance, indigenous leaders change every year with the, year, with the goal that lead, uh, people learn to be leaders when it's necessary. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the, why is the indigenous guard an example of the colonizing humanitarian aid? Uh, aid? Uh, first of all, um, there are many uh, international organizations working with them. They have received support from the Norway Cooperation, the Swedish Cooperation, the United Nations, and they work together, uh, but they give priority to the indigenous people needs, knowledge, and tradition. The role of the international cooperation is only financial support and equipment. The planning and the implementation is completely in the hands of the indigenous organization. And the humanitarian activities are directly planned and implemented by the indigenous guards. Uh, next, please. The right wing government, governments oppose this initiative, and many people in Colombia oppose the initiative as well. They find it dangerous, they find it suspicious. The indigenous guard won the frontline defenders recognition, recognition in 2020 for their humanitarian actions and the contribution to peace building. But as Quijano says, um, in the process of colonization, it was very successful because it linked the distribution of labor to natural to a natural source, which was race. So certain people supposed to be in charge, for instance, of the income, they were the owners of agency. And the rest of the people, and in, in that case, the indigenous people, they supposed to um, be the ones that receive help. 
the receivers of health. So they, the colonization decided who has agency and who has power and who doesn't. So this case is really, for many people, is suspicious because they are not used to, to see indigenous people so powerful. They find it kind of anti-natural. So who has agency and why these people should have power, for instance? So there are expectations about indigenous people that they are breaking, they are challenging these expectations. And that Just is to why say they have two minutes left, Paula. Oh, Sorry. yes, no problem. Yes. Um, so as Michael mentioned it earlier, this colon the colonization process implanted these ideas in the, of what is expected from certain groups. And now seeing these kind of initiatives for many people is just not normal. So the colonizing humanitarian aid, therefore, uh, means giving up power, allowing local co actions, actors to have decision power, to have financial autonomy. In this case, for instance, the international cooperation needs to ask permission for the indigenous organizations to work with them. And then the projects needs to be approved by the, com by the indigenous communities. The execution is in the hands of the people and, the, and then the international cooperation support them. Another interesting concept to discuss here, and with this I will finish, is the ecology of knowledge, which means basically uh, which knowledge needs to be the most important one in each intervention. So the ecology of knowledge is says that in each intervention, we need to reevaluate what is the, the knowledge that needs to be more useful. So for instance, if an humanitarian organization goes to the indigenous people and they don't pay attention to rituals, to symbolic weapons, to, to all the symbols and all the historical signification there, they could really do more harm than good. So it's very important that in each intervention, we question which knowledge should be the most important and which knowledge should be just serving the needs and the knowledge of others. Um, well, with this, I've finished. Um, thank you very much. Chute Pai, thank you, merci, gracias. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, Alexander, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Gabrielle. Thank you, Shep and Tabitha for the invitation. <clears throat> it is a pleasure for me to be here with such qualified colleagues and to discuss such an important subject. I'll be presenting on my experience in Brazil with the organization of consultation processes and racialized uh, with racialized migrant communities regarding the state response to COVID-19 and the designing of health policies. Next slide, please. So Brazil had more than 38 million uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19 and the second larger number of deaths in the world, 707,000 plus deaths so far. Also, Brazil is the country that received the largest number of enslaved Africans in the Americas, and it has experienced projects of assimilation and extermination of its Black and Indigenous populations throughout history. That historical configuration has impacts on, uh, in the present, and it has made racialized migrants and refugees a particularly vulnerable group during the pandemic, living in marginal areas of the largest cities with little resources, a large rate of unemployment, and not knowing how the healthcare system worked, or what their rights were. Many of them uh, lived in public shelters with common bedrooms, dining places and bathrooms, and had to keep working in unsafe conditions during the country's lockdown, being particularly susceptible to COVID-19 uh, infections. Next slide, please. So the number of immigrants in Brazil rose 24% in the last decade, and the majority of uh, this contingent is constituted by Black and Indigenous populations from Latin American and African countries. The exponential growth of the black and brown migrant population stands out. Uh, in 2011, it represented only 13.9% of the migrant workforce in the country, growing to 62.4% in 2020. Uh, also, emergencies and disasters are frequently deemed as opportunities for the withdrawal of rights, which responds to a colonial configuration of politics. This aspect can make these emergencies especially important to reflect on the structural elements of the power dynamics of humanitarian response and of policy making, uh, because they show who is left behind, as, as Michael stated. Uh, my goal here today is to reflect with you through the example of uh, the political mobilizations of racialized migrants in Brazil during the pandemic. Uh, these communities engaged in the country's popular participation and consultation processes for the designing of health policies and as a way 
to halt the withdrawal of rights and to demand a reorganization of the power dynamics within this context. Next slide, please. So racism uh, impacts the reception of black and indigenous migrants who reportedly say that they uh, discover they are black in, uh, in Brazil through racism experiences. They usually uh, face police violence, discrimination in the job market and inconsistency of status, uh, which means uh, they are frequently in a lower social position than the one they were uh, in their home country before migrating. Uh, other than territorial segregation and ghettoization and uh, racialized xenophobia. Uh, regarding the Brazilian healthcare system, uh, which is called SUS, uh, it is one of the largest public healthcare system in the world. Uh, it is universal and provides healthcare to approximately 80% of the population residing in the country. Uh, also, it is the most well-equipped and funded healthcare system in South America and people from neighboring countries migrate to Brazil uh, for health reasons to seek health assistance in SUS. Uh, it has played a fundamental role during the COVID-19 pandemic, being able to provide health services to a large portion of the population living in Brazil, but it was also put under stress during several moments due to the lack of structural and professional resources to assist the demand uh, created by the pandemic. Uh, migrants are benefited by universal access, although there are, uh, there are several barriers to access, such as undocumentedness, defunding, and uh, racialization processes. During COVID-19, for example, investigations uh, demonstrated higher infection rates among uh, racial and ethnic minorities and demonstrated the canalization of uh, COVID-19 vaccines to white populations. That reflected on the access of this population to COVID-19 vaccines, with reports of denial of vaccination of migrants in health units uh, in marginal neighborhoods of the largest cities. Next slide, please. So uh, before moving on, uh, I would like to establish some uh, theoretical grounds Agreeing with Quintero, Figueira, and Elizaldi, I consider coloniality as a pattern of distribution of power inaugurated, inaugurated by uh, modernity that brought along profound consequences for the constitution of Latin America. Through the imposition of reproduction of uh, forms of labor exploitation, uh, a model of social racial stratification between whites and other racial typologies, which were considered inferior, uh, was developed in Brazil and in Latin America in general. Uh, that means that the structural, as uh, structural aspects of coloniality must uh, also be considered in humanitarian actions, which means that in Brazil, structural racism uh, must be considered. Although we mostly refer to emergencies and disasters when talking about humanitarian action, that is uh, disruptions that break the normal course of life, Decolonization uh, must be rendered as a structural and ongoing process that goes beyond the end of the state of emergency, that is, when life goes back to normal. In other words, in order to uh, decolonize the action addressing uh, local political issues is frequently required if we are uh, to uh, reorganize power dynamics and to address inequalities in power imbalances. Uh, given that the goal of most humanitarian aid organization is not to change colonial legacies or current power, in, power imbalances, how can we address structural elements of coloniality? How do we assure rights during a catastrophe? A good way to start is through the establishment of consultation processes in order to engage affected communities. What aid would they consider meaningful? Next slide, please. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, I was involved in organizing several consultation processes with racialized migrant communities throughout Brazil. It is important to remark that uh, migrants were forbidden uh, to form political associations and to engage in political act activities whatsoever in Brazil until 2017. Although it has been a demand for migrant movers, movements from years uh, for years now, they are still not allowed to vote. The first consultation process was with the Association of Immigrant Women Light in Life, a network of Bolivian, Peruvian, Venezuelan, Paraguayan, and Brazilian women who were community leaders in the easternmost uh, region of Sao Paulo, uh, South America's large, largest city. Many of them identified themselves as, as indigenous. 
Members of the association reported several cases of denial of vaccination of COVID-19. And at the time, the municipality of Sao Paulo had already announced that 100% of the population was vaccinated with at least, uh, at least one dose, but these racialized migrants weren't considered. So with the participation of the association, we organized three jo joint efforts that provided, among other things, free regularization services and vaccination against COVID-19. Network I coordinated at the time was responsible for, for contacting the municipal health department to require a, vac a vaccination team and uh, the dismissal of presentation of Brazilian documents to be immunized. And the association was responsible for engaging migrants in the neighborhood. Uh, in total, 106 people were va vaccinated, which corresponded to 21.5% of the uh, total number of immigrants assisted. And of that, 91 of these people, percent of those assisted, uh, and almost 86% of the vaccinated public had not taken the vaccine until that time. Uh, all the events also had conversation circles with migrants and health professionals facilitated by the association's members. Next slide, please. Uh, Brazil has had also a participatory methodology in designing health policies since the 1930s. The current healthcare system was created by a national health conference, which took place in 1985. Uh, a national health conference is a deliberative forum uh, that happens every four years, and it is organized by the National health, uh, Council of Health. Uh, this conference mobilizes users, social movements, health workers, health managers, and government representatives. Uh, and it is constituted by a broad mo mobilization process that congregates municipal, state, and free conferences that elect delegates to be sent to the national stage of the event to vote for guidelines and proposals that will orientate health policies for four years until the next conference. In 2021, uh, I was involved in organizing the first uh, national plenary on migration and health. Uh, it had six stages, uh, five of which was, uh, were regional stages, and one uh, which meant that one for each of Brazil's region. And finally, a uh, national one, uh, which took place in August 2021. Uh, in total, uh, 383 people from 19 different nationalities took part. Approving sorry, total um, Alexander, just to say you have two minutes left. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> So uh, uh, less than two years later, in May 2023, a new consultation process was organized, the first national free conference on health of migrants. The engagement grew, 876 people participated, uh, and, and then they participated also in uh, the first time, for the first time, a migrant delegation participated in the 17th National Health Conference. And as a result, uh, for the first time, in the country's history, migrants were mentioned in the National Council of Health's resolution regarding the priority themes for the health policy in the country for the next four years. Uh, next slide, please. So to conclude and agreeing with Paula, uh, it is not pos possible to ignore structural uh, aspects that precedes, permeates, and uh, are still at play after emergencies and disasters are finished if we are to decolonize humanitarian action. Uh, that way, these interventions must not consider, consider themselves as neutral, uh, neutral to disengage from political context and socially and culturally determined structure. Uh, the structural config configuration of coloniality, such as the asymmetries of power and political exclusion, must be addressed not only as a way to ease resistance of affected populations towards figures of power or uh, towards those promoting these interventions, but aiming for a reconfiguration of power, uh, of the power dynamics at play. That would be it. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks, you. Thank you so much, Alexander. Um, uh, and finally, we have, uh, we have Obindra. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, mm, Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Shab. Thank you very much, uh, Tavita and the Gabriel, uh, following our panelists, uh, fellow mm, fellows. Um, can I go to the next? Can I ask for the next slide, please? I just wanted to uh, echo 
the previous panelists just to recapture theoretical foundations and assumptions i uh, as already discussed decolonizations is not just the birth buzzword Next it's, slide uh, sorry uh, decolonizations is not just the buzzword it is a theoretical or an, a theoretical framework or analytical tool to critically questions to the colonial legacy that is uh, at least started from 15th century to last at until 20th century to in the present day systems and practice particularly in politics culture knowledge and development including humanitarian response and also as emerging these discourses or the discourses from several um, human rights movement, for example, anti-racism, feminism, decolonization questions on the equity justice of the people who are marginalized and vulnerable due to the power imbalance at the local and global context. Next slide, please. Uh, just to uh, give a uh, uh, poor principles of the human uh, humanitarian uh, actions. What are the humanitarian actions and what it is core principles? Uh, as all of us know in this call, uh, here the uh, key objectives of the humanitarian action is to save the lives and elevate the sufferings and maintain the human dignity during and aftermath any sort of crisis, either that is a natural or that or or human made ones and to prevent and strengthen the preparedness for the occurrence of such situations. Uh, as Michael mentioned, key principles of, of mm, humanitarians is uh, humanity, impartiality, neutrality, independence. Uh, next slide, please. To discuss, uh, I will be reflecting on the recent earthquake of Nepal that Nepal hit that occurred in 3rd November 2023, just over a month now. Uh, I just wanted to show you uh, some of the statistics here, but at the same time, I uh, I would, if time permits, I will uh, later discuss on what data does not tell us. What data tell us, just to give you a, a context uh, and level of, of the casualties, but uh, also uh, later when I talk about the equity approach, I will also uh, set lights on uh, what data does not tell us. For example, the casual, casual, the human casualty was uh, 144. And Nepal is one of the Himalayan countries uh, located in so South Asia or Southeast Asia. Uh, the 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 earthquake hit uh, two remote districts of Nepal, known as Jajarpur and Rupum West, where uh, altogether 140 uh, 54 people died during earthquake, uh, due to earthquake. And in Jajarpur, number was 101, where as it was uh, 53 in West Rukum, another district. Uh, and among that, uh, 84 were women while 70 of them were men uh, forgive my uh, typos there uh, and if i go further 81 of them were children 37 were girls and 44 were were boys and over 360 is were injured the total affected household were um 28769 uh, among them uh, 9,483 9, were fully damaged, while 19,286 were partially damaged. The affected families were over 38,000, and among them, uh, over 12,000 were displaced. And this also affected and damages the health facilities. 47 health facilities were dam uh, damaged and then th out of them 13 uh, were non-functional so that 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 implies to the delivery of the regular health systems affected to the marginalized and vulnerable communities among within the marginalized for example over 4000 pregnant women were affected and 
over 200 of them were likely to uh, have uh, uh, likely to experience austeric complications in the uh, next three months. Next slide, please. And to, to respond to this, uh, the government of Nepal um, allocated uh, immediate fund and two types of fund there uh, for the emergency and the temporary shelter. The government again announces uh, announces to provide uh, Nepali fifty thousand rupees, which is equivalent to three hundred seventy four USD, uh, dividing them into the two installment uh, for uh, and uh, like 178, uh, 87 uh, USD in poor for installment. And government of Nepal also appealed international com communities for support to rescue and relief package. At the same time, it also um, announced learning from the our previous um, earthquake which had happened in 2015 government also introduced one door policy meaning all the all the relief and rescue efforts should be channelized through the government channel following one door policy our government operates in three different tiers and the government leads the uh, rescue and uh, rescue relief operations and restructure restructuring of of the after di disaster in collaborations with three different governments within itself and and um, along with other uh, INGOs. Thank you. Next slide, please. The involvement of the uh, INGOs, uh, mainly with different uh, roles, for example, relief distributions to support data, data, data collections and situations of debt. Next slide, please. Uh, I would like to uh, highlight some of the um, some of the uh, practice where uh, the, the if we see the relief and rescue efforts even after a month we can see that uh, that there is unequal access to the relief distributions of the relief package uh, uh, since uh, this is occurred in the November the cold factor is killing of over uh, 40 people, like uh, altogether 43 people, including a month's child after this, uh, so far in the fourth earthquake context. And uh, many of the people with disabilities are also not getting um, required facilities and the Save the Children's now um, provided uh, 18, 8,000 winter tent uh, which is, I guess, um, the, all the tents that are provided, most of the tents that are provided by uh, humanitarian organizations are uh, namely inappropriate to, to cope with the chilling cold of the November and December thing, and uh, December uh, weather in the respective com affected communities. Next slide, please. If we talk about the equity approach, uh, the uh, the uh, the questions of practicing is being is being not made the core principles of the equity, social justice, accountability, and the involvement of 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 the affected people in different stages of relief and uh, relief and emergency responses are not um, met and the respect of, of the diversities within the uh, population group are really neglected. The key, key challenges for that is systemic and, 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 and geographical barriers and limited engagement of the social scientists and interdisciplinary approach and politicizations of relief distributions and the role of public health is is being uh, and seen really limited now. The social determinants is being not included. For instance, the way the the the, way, uh, the weak buildings, mountain regions, the climatic conditions were not thoroughly considered, so that uh, lead to the sufferings of hundreds of people, even the death. Just next to say, I have two two minutes remaining, Obindra. Thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I I will uh, 
conclude my um, um, presentations by just highlighting some of the opportunities of, of decolonization itself and its challenges. Uh, decolonization as a theoretical and analytical tool has provided an alternative perspective to understand the questions and the power asymmetry between global south and the north and in the national and global context thus has led many discussions and debate for instance one of these is uh, a good example and these debates has debates and discussions have reshaped the practices to the some extent for example if we see the partnership engagement community engagement co-designing and co-collaborations approaches have been immersed. If we see uh, the challenges part, I think uh, the decolonizations as our, uh, the webinar topic highlights, it's, it's, it, it does not have a single meaning, thus it is really difficult to contextualize and comprehend and context, contextualize, comprehend and sometimes operationalize. And comparatively, I feel that these sort of discussions are more limited in exploring theories, concepts, meanings, and uh, in other words, it's more uh, limited to um, the academic settings. Um, maybe it needs to be uh, scaled up in different sectors and, and, and areas to understand the issues. Just one, uh, how many minutes do I have? Like one minute? Um, technically, it's five seconds. <laughs> okay, I would stop. I I would love to uh, have a debate, uh, uh, discussions, questions. Can I have a next slide, please? A uh, next slide. All the I would just like to say all the photos uh, that that have I have used throughout the PPT is not mine. They are they are um, put there to just give you a sense, pictorial, visual sense of informations and context. They are freely downloaded either from the Google uh, Google or from the respective uh, websites. Thus, uh, photo credit goes to them who took them originally. Thank you very much. I finally would like to thank Shaf, uh, Davita, Chair Gabriel, and the fellow panelists. Last but not least, all the participants who have uh, allocated their time to participate and listen to us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ovindra, um, and to uh, to Michael, Paula, and Alexander again. Uh, so we're perfectly on time, down to the minute. <laughs> um, so I believe we, we do have time for a, a five-minute break before proceeding to the Q&A. I can see that there are already some questions that have been um, shared in the Q&A, and so we'll, we'll begin with those um, when we pick up. But please do um, post your questions in the uh, the Q&A box using the Q&A function that's at the bottom of your screen um, instead of sharing those in the chat. Um, and then we can compile all of the questions there. Um, I, please feel free to post questions either in English or in French. Um, I'll translate any questions posed in French to the panelists so that they can respond. Um, so yes, yeah, so we'll reconvene um, in, in five minutes. Um, yeah, I guess is there is there anything else that I should I should mention before then, Tabitha? No, I think that that sounds good. We'll see everybody back in five minutes and do take the time to think of a question to pose to our panelists. Thanks, everyone.
Um, just as we trickle back into the uh, the room, so to speak, um, just a reminder to to please share your questions using the Q and A function. Um, I realize that it's maybe not um, optimal for for everybody, but um, given that we have so little time to uh, to collect questions and so little time for the participants to, for the panelists to address them, um, this will allow us to. Uh, to maximize the limited time that we have um, for Q&A, if we can collect all of these using the Q&A function. Um, I, just to note that um, I, we will share the slides um, for those who are um, would like to access these resources. Um, and I know that we have a few questions in the um, in the Q&A box, I know that um, Paola and Michael have um, indicated that they'd um, like to take these in turn. Maybe we'll start with the really the specific question that's being directed to you, Paola. Uh, I start? Okay. Um, thank you very much for the question. I need to say this, sorry, but for me, this format is very impersonal and it's, it makes me suffer. I would love to hear people's voice and know where they come from. And also it will be important for me to, to tell more, more about our positionality, my positionality. But of course we don't have time, so I'm going to be brief. The question about uh, the children, how the children voluntarily join the guard uh, is a very good question because it, it, may, it gives me the opportunity to discuss how we always see things from our perspective, from Western perspective, right? So what are, are the child, what is the role of child and where they should be, where, uh, what the children should do? Uh, so the short answer will be they join it voluntarily because they've been asked if they want to join. But the long answer is that uh, when we send our children to school, uh, we don't ask them, do you want to go to school? Uh, it's, uh, we assume they need that to be, uh, to be functional in society, right? So for indigenous people, uh, they are, they, they, the kids are not forced to go to the guard. It's just the ones that want to go. And the, the, the children that go to the guard, they have very specific tasks. So they don't join the dangerous situations, for instance, or the dangerous activities. They mainly, for instance, help with, with organize, organizing the markets, uh, with uh, helping with the community. So it's more uh, uh, working with the community, uh, but this prepares them for them when they become uh, adults to be part of the guard uh, in, the, in the more dangerous situations. Uh, but yes, I mean, our Western perspective uh, is like, but how a, ch a children could be in this? So they also protect the children by giving them the tasks that are not dangerous, uh, tasks that are more about learning. But uh, it's important that we always consider how our Western perspective puts also a lot of order in society and what is the order that should be there. And when we work with communities with a different perspective from a different world, we cannot use the same framework. We need to shift, shift it or be open to different possible explanations to their actions. And that's very important in humanitarian action that we consider this whenever we go to do interventions, um, right? Um, I don't know if that uh, answered the question properly. <laughs> Thank you, Paula. Um, there are a few questions that I think speak to um, that all of the, it would be interesting to hear all of the um, the panelists' responses to. Um, and so perhaps I'll begin with the, one of the first ones that was posed about, um, uh, to varying degrees, you've all touched on, you know, this question of practical action. And as one of the, the attendees um, indicates, you know, those who are um, attending <laughs> this webinar are also interested in and sort of believe that there is this, there is absolutely a need to decolonize humanitarian action. And so in terms of how that translates to practical action, what practical action do you recommend for those who are working, for those practitioners who are working um, in the humanitarian sector and who, who are also committed to this work? Um, maybe Michael, if you would like to to begin and if um, the four speakers could provide brief responses to that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Gabriel. So uh, my first reaction will be to say that it's important to, to speak with the people. It's important to hear what the people think about how they can be uh, assisted, find out from the people uh, what works for them, find out from the people how they define 
uh, their circumstances, their challenges, and then uh, find out also how you can support them to help themselves rather than thinking that you have all the solutions and then uh, you, you're, you're hoping that they cooperate with you uh, while you help them. It's better to acknowledge their agency and then support them to help themselves. So, uh, so that's the first thing. And then I saw a question on uh, reparations. I don't know whether I can uh, quickly share my thoughts on that. I personally don't think that's the solution um, because, uh, well, maybe the only thing that will achieve is give this sense of absolution to uh, people who presently have a, a feeling of guilt, but I don't see reparation uh, solving uh, the problem because it's bigger than that. Thank you. Thank um, Alexander, then Obindra, and then Paola, maybe if you can <laughs> address the, the question of practical action, um, recommended practical actions for those who are working within the humanitarian sector. Yeah, uh, so first I agree with Michael that, uh, as I uh, highlighted uh, during my presentation, that consultation processes are really important. Uh, but not only asking uh, uh, their opinion, maybe, uh, or uh, uh, otherwise, uh, they would uh, be just helping. Uh, uh, I don't know how to how to think the action that they will receive passively. Uh, I think that uh, uh, structuring ways to co-manage actions. Uh, sometimes we think that these communities uh, are so deprived that they can't help. Uh, thinking on how to organize and how to structure the, the aid that they are uh, uh, interested in, re in receiving. Uh, so I agree that it is important to acknowledge uh, agency, but also uh, to, to provide ways for them to performance that agency and to co-manage uh, actions uh, together. And uh, also I saw uh, a question uh, on Q&A for me and Paula, uh, that goes in that way. How to uh, how to uh, articulate and, and uh, get approval or, or something like that uh, uh, with government authorities and to, to negotiate conditions with uh, government uh, authorities and community leaders. Um, in my case, uh, at least many times, uh, as in the vaccination campaign example, the demands came from the community and they also helped to co-manage and to organize the actions. Uh, the government, uh, the government uh, authorities are a more difficult part of it because there's this uh, uh, state bureaucracy and uh, it is hard to navigate that, uh, but that's why it is important to have also uh, alliances. That's why, for example, in my example, only migrant communities could not do that. Uh, I, I tried to highlight that uh, political exclusion uh, is one of the, the assets of coloniality. And that's why Brazilians needed to, to be there also to demand from, from government authorities. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Bindra, would you like to address the question of around practical, practical yeah. action? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, Gabriel, also, you also need to help me in terms of translating the things. The, I saw there is one question uh, question, uh, like directed to me, but this that was uh, this was uh, this is on French, I guess. That's what uh, maybe you want me uh, to come later on that as well. That should be fine. I think the when we talk about the practical uh, considerations um, and some of the key issues or key aspects that came into my mind in terms of how uh, these uh, the humanitarian responses or actions could be decolonized or uh, can think of in a in an alternative perspective is I guess. Generally, uh, humanitarian, uh, any sort of, of, of um, when it comes to this sort of um, uh, natural disaster or any sort of disaster, uh, 
people tend to take or or even organizations or uh, professional engaged in in this uh, sector tend to take it more as as a uh, disaster disaster event i think one of the thing we should think of a uh, think it as uh, using a holistic perspective by holistic perspective i mean it's interconnection uh, uh, interconnections and in its impact on the sociologically called demographic variables and other things were and i think another aspect could be cultural competencies let me give you an example nepal recently hit it uh, by a 6.4 magnitude earthquake that was held, uh, that was stopped in november as i already told you but many of the organizations including ngos involved in this particularly in collaborations with the ngos local organization uh, local non governmental organizations ngos distributed tarpaulins normal tarpaulins uh, which is usually fit or appropriate for the summer seasons not for the winter seasons as a result they fail to con con consider they they fail to uh, anticipate the winter is already uh, already on on a wave that hit it in, in in november so that as i as i showed in the presentations in the post earthquake context 43 people lost their lives and many of the morbidities associated with the chilling cold is taking place and hundreds of people are suffering due to the coldness as a result just yesterday like uh, 11th oh, 13th of december save the children dispatched 8000 winter tents to to alleviate the sufferings of particularly marginalized and vulnerable communities including pregnant women disabled pe and people with disabilities and senior citizens many of them lost their lives uh, so i think when we talk about uh, practical practical approach uh, how should we uh, to to target towards that is perhaps everybody can understand this is emergency and the uh, it's it's the, the quick response is demanded, but then in the name of quick response, if we fail to consider some of the essential aspect, for example, cultural competency, uh, social determinants, and disaggregated data, I I I already uh, I just indicated that I uh, some of the data that showed in the slides don't tell many other aspect. For example, the cost ethnicities and the vulnerabilities within the vulnerable group is not tell so that the equitable when it comes to equitable distributions that's always been challenged and limited only in the policies leads to suffering and in the worst case scenario death of the people and those death usually occur among the most marginalized populations in the community of the affected reason thank you very much i will stop here thank you Abindra. maybe paula if you want to pick up on that question of um of uh, practical action um and perhaps on also the question from mariam about nego that alexander started to um to address about negotiating yeah. conditions with governmental yeah. and community authorities and then um there are a few questions that i'm seeing on um uh, donors, funders that I'll try to collate yeah. after you've had the chance to respond. Yeah, I, I also saw all the questions, uh, not all because there are many now, but uh, many of the questions address the issue of how to implement it. And for me, it's really uh, the shorter way, way to say it is we really need to go beyond participation. Participation is not uh, decolonizing, right? But what we need to talk when we are talking about decolonizing humanitarian aid is co design the intervention, co-management, co-implementation. I mean, it's really at work together in the same level. No one receiving the help and, and we let them participate. That doesn't, that's not decolonizing it. So we need to go beyond participation. That's the first thing. The, the second is we need to prioritize the needs and the knowledge of the community over the ones of the governments. Many, in many times the governments are going to be the obstacle to, uh, to do proper, um, 
decolonizing humanitarian action. And I don't think the governments are aware of this. And especially in countries that have been colonized, we most of the times uh, the, the, the system of uh, government is still really colonized. And the people that govern, that are the governors of our countries, normally they come from believing themselves being superior because they are either more mestizos, or so a little bit whiter than, than the others, or because they, they westernize their behavior completely and because they have been educated completely in Western systems in, and abroad. So then they believe they know better. So I don't think the government will be, in many cases, an ally. But we could finalize, and I think what Alex says was very important. We need allies, and uh, ally, and, and we can create these al allies, or we can work on these alliances at local uh, level because these are the pe the people that is affected. But they also have uh, agency, and they also also have knowledge and tools. So I think that's uh, that will be my 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 way to talk about this in a more uh, practical way. Um, uh, but I know, I, and I recognize in many of the questions that there are a lot of obstacles in terms of recognizing the problem, recognizing and, and the need of money. We need financial support. So I, I for instance, don't advocate for finishing humanitarian aid at all. I think we need it, it's necessary, but we need also the, 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 the financial support, but we need it to manage in a more uh, respectful way with the people that we are working with and not with this paternalistic, uh, that way that we just deny agency and we just uh, uh, use uh, the role of colonizer again, or we uh, or we become these white saviors, for instance. So that's the whole point that we really go beyond this. I will thank say. you, I thank you, Paula. And I think that maybe links directly into the sort of collection of questions that I'll maybe I'll ask you to address um, collectively next. So there are a few questions um, from Charlie Hellman, from um, Nisha Jakar, and from um, uh, and also I think uh, Jonas Marenga's question um, address this. You know, both the clear economic <laughs> constraints to um, and needs associated with humanitarian. Um, response and the, the clear power imbalances, uh, and also the possibilities for challenging donors and partners who are involved in funding humanitarian response. And so maybe to pick up on um, these, the just try to summarize imperfectly these questions. Um, I, what examples, um, or perhaps some version, if you can address any version of this question, examples of, you know, instances of challenging partners um, to to address this question of um, decolonization, what res receptivity um, have you seen, if any? Um, what will it take <laughs> to to shift the mindsets of um, of large aid agencies? How to proceed, essentially, maybe to um, uh, to paraphrase uh, Jonas Marenge's question. So perhaps in this, if we take this in the same order, if you could all offer some brief thoughts on this, on the challenge of and opportunities for engaging with um, with humanitarian funders. Maybe if you would like to begin, Michael. Yeah, thank you, uh, Gabriel. Uh, the first question, I mean, there are so many questions now, uh, but the one on who the people and organizations are involved in the movements, um typically uh the academia more of the academia than practitioners and also typically uh maybe researchers from low and middle income countries who have moved uh to high income countries that that's uh, those are the people uh you see uh leading uh the movement mainly and then the main source what could be the main source of humanitarian um uh, humanitarian action, what alternatives do we have to the West? The alternative, I'll say, is to look in what Africans, for instance, need to seek uh, local solutions more than they do uh, presently. And then how receptive are mainstream uh, large aid agencies? The truth is that they are not particularly receptive of this idea. And it has to a large extent to do with framing, the way uh, the issues have been framed. Uh, so they're not so, not so receptive uh, because of the framing of the message. Uh, then to shift mindsets, well, yeah, I think the starting point is to, is to talk about uh, the problem. Uh, I'll stop here so that others can also 
uh, make their contributions. So yeah, I, I will be brief also. Uh, I think that uh, <clears throat> uh, the first remark that I would like to, to make is that there are no impartial INGOs. I think that uh, this is something that uh, uh, demonstrate what I was trying to convey in my uh, presentation that uh, all these contexts are interconnected and uh, uh, there must be also an interconnected international effort uh, to change structural aspects, um, political aspects uh, that must be addressed uh, before we can we can uh, make local efforts to, I think that they can be simultaneously uh, local efforts to decolonize, but it also has to be something to be uh, challenged in an international perspective. That's why I think that is so important to, to be in a, a, a on a webinar, in a webinar, uh, uh, talking to people from the global north, and uh, uh, I, I think that we, we must uh, structure structure uh, alliances to uh, take these opportunities to to uh, to arrange and to structure interconnected efforts, uh, so we can uh, dismantle this mechanism that uh, does not have only local impacts. I think that's it. Obindra and, and Paola, if you have any brief thoughts, I realize we're at um, one, officially one minute okay. left until the um, the planned end. But if you have um, just some a uh, few summary thoughts on those questions of engaging with. Yeah, um, I think, yeah. Owners. I think I want to echo Paola here. Like uh, it's, it's not that uh, we are completely uh, and totally negative about the humanitarian thoughts, perhaps the, the ways that it has been um, just to uh, healthily and critically questioning the patterns of the humanitarian action and perhaps uh, sapping uh, the policies for and leading to the practices which will be dignified, uh, respected and address the diversities. In the recent earthquake, context in Nepal, the government of Nepal introduced the one-door policy for the relief distributions and uh, rescue operations of, of the earthquake victim in the respect affected districts or the communities in the affected areas, for instance. And what does that mean? Means no one like can go and distribute or provide required relief uh, relief items or uh, support to the community directly without coordinating and contacting the different tiers of government uh, based on their uh, what they want to do for instance they can based on their uh, objectives they can co collaborate or cooperate coordinate with the federal government also provincial government and the um, local government to, to deliver the services. This is, I guess, one of the uh, policies that government has been taking for that. Uh, it's not that it is, when, uh, it is the eventual thing, or uh, I mean, like the final things, perhaps uh, there are rooms for improvement, how these one-door policies could be improved, uh, where power uh, relations between the different tiers of government within the government and its external partner, INGOs or other organizations could be rethink and, 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 and raise to the decisions so as to feel them comfortable for, uh, for the both parties and the beneficiaries, but I think it's one of the practice that Nepal has taken in terms of responding humanitarian situation. I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you, Abindra. Paula, um, yes, well, I'll uh, hand it over to you to provide a brief response or some final reflections perhaps on, on any of these questions. Um, I... 
I'm, I'm trying to link it uh, with the things that I'm also reading in the question. So I'm a little bit lost of what was the question that you want me to answer? <laughs> well, originally it was about the engagement with receptivity among on the part of um, funders. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, but I, I know I that was, there are yeah, so questions reading, going in many different directions. <laughs> yes, yes. I think I, I, I see a lot of frustration in the questions, maybe. That's what we, because we we face a, a lot of, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the way the system has been organized for a, forever, it has been in a way in which some people manage the money and some people receive the help. I mean, and that is the colonizing system, right? So breaking that is not easy, and uh, and, uh, and 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 I, I cannot stress enough the importance of alliance of alliances, finding your allies, working with them mainly in the in the local communities. Mm. But I I do understand the frustration, and I do think it's very difficult to change, and I do think there are very uh, huge, powerful international organizations that are not uh, interested on this type of changes because that poses a big challenge. For them, but I think practitioners we are in a position of creating change by in the way we work with people at the local level, uh, and that could be uh, already a difference. And, and change is not going to occur easily, and it's not going to be fast. So you just you just need to keep going yourself in your own work, how you uh, work with people, and 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 as long as you uh, don't do processes of processes of othering. And you don't believe that you yourself are the wise person with all the knowledge and all the money, but you understand that your knowledge is limit. Uh, you might have more resources, use, uh, use them wisely, and always consult the communities. I think I really does them. The communities are the ones affected, the ones that know the best right now, and not all the cases. I also have seen cases in which the communities are really in a very vulnerable situation in which they don't have uh, more actions for themselves, but in that, then you also work on empowering the community and the, uh, so they can get uh, uh, their own power back. I mean, in the end, we always have a little bit of power uh, and that's important to recognize it. I think that's very key. That we always recognize that there is power in people and we give it and we encourage that power, even if they are in the most vulnerable condition. And I think that nicely speaks to the one of the final questions about um, uh, can we really, you know, sort of speak of humanitarian interventions if communities have not taken part in, you know, sort of setting the terms for that um, for that intervention. And so that question of of co design and not simply, you know, sort of a hollow idea of participation that you touched on earlier, I think speaks really directly to um, uh, to that to that comment question. Um, just to say that I know there are some questions that we didn't have the chance to address. I think there's a really um, a really important one um, from Marianne Boyon about you know sort of advice that you would give to young uh, researchers who are interested in actively contributing. Um, uh, to the you know sort of these conversations and efforts toward decolonization of the humanitarian sector, um, but perhaps these are you know sort of connections that um, can be pursued uh, and follow up questions and conversations that can take place after um, after the end of this uh, this short <laughs> discussion. I just wanted to come in and. Um apologize for going over today, but thank you to everyone who's joined and uh, Mariam and, and others who have been in our audience today are also SHAP fellows. So we're all part of a network together and we can pursue these discussions um, onward. But many thanks um, to our panelists, um, Gabrielle as well, and to our translation team and also Ideas Communications. Uh, thank you so much from SHAP and from myself and uh, any, any final words from you, Gabrielle or panelists? No, I, 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 I don't want to keep anyone longer than we've had to. But thank you. I just, yes, thank you all again for the, um, the such, such thoughtful and careful presentations, and for the the thoughtful and reflective questions. It's been yeah, a privilege to to be able to listen <laughs> to all of this. Thank you as well. And I really think that so many interest, so many people interested in the topic already shows that it is not so bad as we think. Mm -hmm. And so uh, today I had a conversation with other people and we were talking about how to keep energy for change and don't get frustrated. 
So it is important that every time we meet, we always remember that there is possibility of change and we are not alone. I mean, these all, all these people here show that we are not alone. So whenever you feel alone, remember that there were a lot of people talking about this with you. At some <laughs> <laughs> and some people might listen. So keep keep talking about this. I don't think there are any better words that we could end on. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Yeah, it's nice. I'm mm -hmm. privileged to be part of this panel. Thank you, everyone.